I am a Westerner. As a scholar, I rarely stop to investigate that statement. I grew up in the traditional lands of Ishii, the last wild Indian. Like every other Californian, I made a mission out of sugar cubes in the fourth grade. And a lifelong fascination with the neighboring ghost towns no doubt influenced my later career choice. Thanks largely to the efforts of the new Western historians, as a scholar, I fully appreciate that the historical narrative of the West is found in no small part in mythology. However, as a resident, I know that mythology is deep, intangible, and formidable. The phenomenon of what Richard White referred to as the imagined West is not just pervasive in popular culture. Scholars have worked hard to problematize the traditional Western narratives, yet we've never successfully escaped them. The players on the Western stage have been diversified, their actions read more critically. However, many of the overarching backgrounds and contexts have remained fairly static. As such, the familiar Western archetypes have led to somewhat recursive relationships for those living and working in the West. We strive to deconstruct these narratives while at the same time they're constantly being reforged. Much of the Western narrative has grown out of historical events. The eventicity of the Western migration, the gold rush, the railroad, etc., is part of what separates the West from the rest of the nation. These events are essentially contacts, points in time when two bounded sets of participants meet, clash, shape, and so forth, and inevitably change the course of history even up on a local and regional level. As we know, these experiences lead to many versions of the same tale, and all can be true. However, within the historiography of the American West, the events themselves become powerful characters, often co-opting or overshadowing the experiences of individual participants. These stories are, and always have been, appropriated and enhanced for the benefit of an American audience. The West as a thing was born of these tales, which allowed for a vast area of land, encompassing a diverse range of environmental and cultural contexts, to be unified under a set of cohesive narratives. In short, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So therein lies the rub, because what do we deal with as archaeologists? The parts. In my experience as a native Westerner living and working almost exclusively in California and Oregon, the West is not so much as a hard boundary as it is a liminal space balancing several identities. While the stories of the West tend to polarize participants into and types of experiences, in reality it's much more of a jungle. Even today, Westerners are simultaneously proud of their historical role in the more adventurous chapters of American history, yet wholly focused on the future. The West is home to big leaps in innovative technology like green energy in Silicon Valley, yet with large populations dependent on traditional extractive industries like logging, fishing, mining, and so forth. Today, like 150 years ago, Westerners are both reliant on and defensible of the federal government, and the list goes on. So while we're trying to escape the pervasive themes of Western historiography, we're still surrounded by them. As someone who studies the 19th century gold rush, in Oregon, it was difficult to overlook the 21st century green rush, if you will. My rural property bears the scars of placer mining, ditches, and tailings piles dating to the 1870s, right alongside cut pads and PVC pipes used to accommodate illicit marijuana grows of the 1980s. Marijuana cultivation, processing, and distribution has once again brought an influx of population, money, and a robust disposable economy to the region. As this industry has shifted from the black market to the gray market to the upcoming free market, this pot boom is headed for a bust. In the exact location of the Modoc Wars in the 1870s, cowboys and Indians have still been struggling over resource issues. Unsustainable growth in agriculture paired with ongoing drought has created water shortages in the Klamath Basin, leading to what have been called the water wars. These modern wars have been fought in courtrooms and range from rational discussions with cooperative outcomes to assertions of water rights akin to manifest destiny wherein the farmer has the right to grow potatoes in the desert, even at the cost of native fish die out. And parts of Oregon have regressed to a somewhat lawless frontier. When sparsely populated Josephine County was facing budget deficits, county residents have repeatedly voted to cut nearly all public safety funding. When faced with the lack of responders to 911 and other emergencies, an official from the Sheriff's Department suggested, quote, you might want to consider relocating if you're in a domestic violence or other volatile situation because they can't protect you. 
Much of the West is sparsely populated compared to the East, consists of large tracts of open lands, and the communities tend to be resource rich but capital poor. These factors, most notably the lack of development, have led to the incredible preservation of, import, um, of important cultural resources. However, funding, oversight, and local buy-in can be tough to come by. In addition, many communities celebrate their identity as a relic of the Wild West. On one project, I was told that two marble elephants marked the location of a former brothel, but I soon found out that these statues were instead a 21st century gag gift of pink plaster elephants given to a former resident who was the, local, uh, the owner of a local tavern. As the pink paint faded, the meaning of the statues was reappropriated by locals eager to connect with the region's frontier legacy. These stories, when embraced by communities, can create a positive feedback loop that can be difficult for archaeologists to counter. Conversely, when I excavated an early 20th century boarding house bin, chock full of feminine items like perfume, jewelry, medicine, irrigators, etc., I immediately thought, brothel. Instead, the household was home to the head of the local temperance union and her poor daughters, who, is, who successfully campaigned a local auction law prohibiting alcohol in 1904. So this material um, culture did indeed reflect women, but women who played a very different role in their community. Had I not found the documentation on that family, these women would have been victims of the Western mythos. At my hand, their experience would have been inadvertently co-opted by the well-established archetype of the Western woman. I am captivated by the mythic West even as I pick these narratives apart. As a woman living in in working in the West, I've been both shaped by and rebelling against many of these this narrative my entire life. From a young age, I was presented with a limited amount of Western female role models, the prostitute, Indian princess, Calamity Jane. A few years back, I stumbled across this photo of my sister and I experiencing the West as children. And while I will not deny the allure of dressing up like this at this age, <laughs> when I recently had the opportunity to retake this photo, I wanted to go a different direction. I told the photographer I wanted to be a minor, not a prostitute, not a showgirl, a minor. And they were taken so back and found this, the end result so novel, they hung it in the window. <laughs> so if you go to Virginia City, you can see if it's still there. <laughs> as a scholar working in the West, I continue to search for these role models that I never had as a youth. I have uncovered the story of local women, made invisible by prejudice and circumstance, the untold histories of populations, marginalized who were participating in the settlement and the development of Oregon. And undeniably, I have continued to tell the story of the West, stories that I believe to be true and based on tangible evidence, but nonetheless ones that are, that are tailored for an American audience. With this in mind, where do we go from here? Perhaps linking these narratives of the West with the rest of the country will allow us to escape the shadow of the Western event-based narrative. Not all of the beloved Western fantasy past is intrinsically problematic, particularly when relegated to the appropriate setting. The danger is in the lure and the bias in the extent to which these narratives can hijack the interpretation of archeological contexts. As Western scholars, there's a need to better integrate our work into ongoing discussions within the historical archeology span community. While many of the historical contexts in the West appear somewhat quaint or unique, to scholars working elsewhere, they're anything but. The uh, issues of identity, cultural pluralism, capitalism, they're relevant. As such, many of these themes we're working with have a tangible Eastern counterpart. Money made and lost in the West built and destroyed Eastern empires. And these ties are what makes these stories from the West and of the West American stories. Thank you.